All right, this is another quick midterm review video over experimental design. All right, so the key thing I want to go over real quick are the four main aspects to experimental design. The first, uh, and again, these are in no particular order, but the first uh, main idea is random assignment. All right, and this is as simple as who gets what. When you have to assign your subjects, it must be done randomly. So once you have your 50 volunteers, who gets treatment A, who gets treatment B, who gets treatment C, must be done by a random process. That random process can be made as simple as everybody gets a number, 0, 1 through 50, using a random number generator. The first um, you know, 50 cannot be divided perfectly evenly, so you're going to have to have one group be a little bit different. But let's just say that the first 16 get treatment A, and then you're going to continue to pick the next 16, and they get treatment A, and the remaining 18 get treatment C. Again, they don't have to be perfectly even in each group, so you're going to do your absolute best that you can to get them as even as possible. Now, the idea is, in this case, I would have to ignore repeats, because I can't have the same person in each trial, but they have to have random assignment. And you don't just have random assignment for fun, you have random assignment because your goal is to make these three groups as similar as possible, meaning that any characteristics between them you want to have because just coincidence, right? You want to have men in all the groups, girls in all the groups, different ages in all the groups. You want the groups to be very, very different within, which means that you want them to be very, very similar between. If there is any difference, you want it to just be pure coincidence because you want it to be truly random. All right, the second idea we have here is replication. Replication is the idea of repetition, repeating, right? The more subjects, the better. Basically, if I have 16, 16, and 18 in these groups, I'm going to really be able to see them. I mean, those are pretty good, solid numbers. I'm going to be able to detect a difference. If I just have one person in each group, boy, oh boy, one person can get better for because of pure coincidence. And replication helps me kick coincidence out the door. It helps me say, no, 16 people all got better because of A, where 16 and B and 18 and C didn't get better. So that truly makes me see that my treatments are working. Obviously, the more, more than 16 would be better, but anything's better than one in that case. Okay, number three here is comparison. The idea of comparison is that you need to have at least two groups. You have to have at least two groups. Now, a lot of questions says, is, does one of them have to be a control group? No, it does not have to be a control group. If you're just comparing three medications, medication A, medication, medications, or medication B, and medication C, you don't necessarily need a control group if that is all you want to do is compare those. Could you add a control group that gets a placebo? Absolutely, but it's not a necessity. You just have to have at least two treatments given out. Out, one of them doesn't have to be a fake placebo. And number four is that you need control, right? You want to have a lot of control over what these people do. You want the only difference between them to be what you give them, whether it be A, B, or C, which means all other aspects should be controlled as much as you can. Some things are possible to control, other things you just can't really control for, and that's where you have to allow the random assignment to put those items in all three groups. All right, now here's an example of a you know, pretty decent problem here. To determine the effects of drinking Gatorade to help recover after an athletic event, researchers randomly divide 75 athletes into three groups. One group drank a 16-ounce bottle of Gatorade after a race. The second group drank a 16-ounce bottle after and before the race. And the third group drank 16 ounces of water after the race. So the first question says, was this observational or experimental? Well, let's see here. The idea was we wanted to know, can drinking Gatorade help, re help you recover? So my exploratory variable is drinking Gatorade. And I gave that in three different increments, no Gatorade in the form of water, Gatorade before and after, and Gatorade versus just after. And then my response variable was, you know, your recovery. And maybe they're going to do some type of test to determine that. Now, the fact that I actually randomly divided these groups out and gave them something to do, it wasn't just that I observed them, that does make this an experimental for sure. So really kind of two reasons why it's experimental. One is because there was random assignment into the groups. 
and the second is because I gave them the Gatorade to drink. So those are the two things that does make it experimental. Now the next question is why have the group that got water? Well that would be a control group in this case. Now why do I need that control group here? Because if I want to truly see if Gatorade helps you recover, I need to make sure I could show that it helps you recover better than water. Because if I want to market my Gatorade, then I need to know that it is better than water. Um, I, could I just have them do nothing? Well, maybe I already know that doing nothing, you know, not drinking anything after the race is actually detrimental. It's not going to help you recover at all. So I'm doing the water simply for a comparison because that way I could truly see if having the Gatorade is better than water. So that's why I need that group in this case. That's why I have it. Again, you don't need a control group, but in this case, it's smart to have it. That way I can have that comparison. Uh, last question is, can you generalize the results to people outside this study? Now, that's a really important question, right? We talked about um, as long as you have random assignment, as long as I take these 75 people and randomly assign the 25, the 25, the 25, I can show cause and effect. Okay, now that's the idea that we talked about in class is that cause and effect can be shown in an experiment with random assignment. However, if these 75 people were only volunteers because, you know, they had a volunteer for this, I couldn't make people participate in this study, then I probably cannot generalize results to people outside the study because I used those 75 volunteers. Now, if those 75 people were truly randomly taken from the population, they didn't have a choice, I randomly picked them, and then I did the random assignment, then I could show cause and effect, and I could generalize to all people. But because those 75 people were most likely volunteers to do this, unfortunately, I cannot generalize the results to people outside of this study. So there's a big difference between being able to say cause and effect, and then being able to say this is going to work for everybody. Um, so hopefully that is clear to you. Just a couple other aspects about this experiment. I do have replication because I have 25 people in each group. So 25 is a good solid number. I, as long as those 25 people are consistently showing me better results because they drank Gatorade, then I can show that this is cause and effect here. Um, I do have control. I'm gonna, Obviously, I'm going to assume that they all run the same race. The race is all the same length of time or the same distance at least. Um, they all were drinking 16 ounces of whatever it was I gave them, whether it be Gatorade, before, after, just after, or even the water. So you can't tell me that the amount I give them matters. So those are all kind of things that I was controlling there. I was using all athletes, so I wanted to make sure I was using people who you know, we're already used to running race. It wouldn't be fair if I used some people that um, were couch potatoes and, you know, weren't really good at running a race at all. Um, I also have comparison. The fact that I have the three different groups gives me that comparison. And it did say that there was randomly selection. It says they were randomly divided into the um, groups. So I kind of have all the major aspects of an experiment here. So this is a pretty good example of an experiment. And there's a lot of kind of things that we talked about there that... Um, I think makes sense. So pretty easy, just trying to make you guys understand a couple of the quick things that we learned about in terms of experimental design.